far more uh, detailed legal directions. Their, their um, summing up is far more open to criticism in the appellate courts than it ever was in the past. <coughs> Judges in the United Kingdom are, of course, appointed um, as being wholly independent of the executive. They're appointed by the Judicial Appointments Commission in an allegedly transparent and, I have to accept on the whole, genuinely transparent process. This is in stark contrast to the serious criticism recently made by former law lords, um, particularly Lord Hoffman, renowned for his human rights philosophy in respect of the International Criminal Court, where it's said that the appointment of judges is totally opaque and where judicial qualifications for appointment to that court are effectively non-existent, whereas in the United Kingdom, many years of legal practice is an essential, as it is in other jurisdictions where respectable judicial um, systems operate. Judges are strictly um, monitored in terms of any abuse of power. This year there have been two cases in the Court of Appeal where judges have been severely criticised for criticising the Crown Prosecution Service for bringing a case. One case, the judge said um, that he didn't believe the case should be brought before the court. On the other, he said, I don't want my court time wasted on rubbish like this. And in both cases, it was made clear that judges should effectively mind their own business where the instigation of proceedings are concerned. Contrary to how it used to be in my early years as a barrister where judges tended to treat defence counsel as being more culpable than the defendants themselves. In the modern day, the Court of Appeal will not tolerate what was recently described in the Court of Appeal as the judge acting as a second prosecutor. Animosity towards counsel is a thing of the past. Judicial comment about counsel to the jury and counsel's competence and so on um, is a long forgotten concept. <coughs> And so moving, for, for fear of myself being on the receiving end of strict judicial boundaries, which have already been um, exemplified uh, once, um, let me just move to, towards the conclusion of what I'm going to say. And I just want to come back briefly to the jury system, because it may, I hope, be of interest that in the United Kingdom recently, it has been evidence, compellingly, that the public are as strongly in favour of trial by jury rather than trial by judge as ever before. In fact, um, the last government implemented for the first time in 400 years the right to trial by judge in cases where there is evidence that the jury may be intimidated um, by, uh, uh, by serious criminal, uh, criminal criminals to the point that no fair trial could take place. This was greeted in the media by uh, headlines such as an attack on the rights of the public, an assault on the standing of every <coughs> citizen. We now have a mockery of justice where a judge, a case-hardened, paid-up representative of the Crown, will determine the outcome rather than a panel drawn at random from society, was the response. A Ministry of Justice report this year complements juries in many respects, not least on a widespread national statistical analysis on the ground that there is simply no evidence of any racial discrimination that all white juries are as liable to convict white defendants as black or Asian defendants, that juries reach verdicts on logical bases in almost every case, and that the myth that there are geographical discrepancies in the approach juries take to cases is not well founded. Whereas judges have been on the receiving end of significant criticism by the Lord Chief Justice himself, who says that they must come into the 21st century, that they must give juries much clearer directions on modern day forensic bodies of te highly technical evidence, that they must guide juries far more stringently, that they themselves must use visual aids and computer type uh, equipment uh, rather than simply reading from their notebooks <coughs> and, and um, operating in what one court of judge recently described as Dickensian fashion. In fact, Lord Justice Moses a very senior appellate judge in a lecture last week himself launched a scathing attack on the trial judiciary. I don't suppose he'll be very welcome at Lincoln's in lunch hall after Christmas. But anyway, he said that the glory of English law 
well, we seem to have hit upon a system designed to ensure that in all but the simplest of cases, the path we require juries to take should be obscure, tortuous and arduous as could be when it comes to judges' functions as a guide to the jury. That, yes, I'm almost there. In fact, I'll finish within a minute. Um, when it comes to judges' functions in guiding the jury, they are by no means as competent as when they themselves exercise individual judicial responsibility. So that is, uh, I hope, a, a quick race through um, the judicial structure and significant um, judicial developments. And as I've already indicated, I certainly don't want um, Mr. Justice Foster to make a ruling against me, so I'm going to finish approximately 10 seconds early. Thank you very much. Uday Shankar, Assistant Professor of Law, Rajiv Gandhi School of Intellectual Property Law, Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. Mr. Prakran, Mr. Jarni Jain, and Mr. Rajiv Pandey, and ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to present my views on need of independent and reflective judiciary in India. Before this gathering, I'll be speaking on the need to have a reflective and representative judiciary in the light of uh, changing role of the higher judiciary. The scheme of the presentation would be, I'll be first speaking on role of judiciary then the composition of judiciary, then the debate which I'll be presenting before you, how it has been institutionalized, and the justification of the need of reflective judiciary, instances I'll present before you, and the debate between merit and representation. And then obviously I'll conclude with few conclusing remarks. When you talk about the role of judiciary, uh, traditionally speaking, judiciary has been involved or rather evolved in settling disputes between two litigating parties in accordance with law. That's what is the traditional role of judiciary and that's how we understand judicial role in the setup of the governance. To take it further, the judiciary, that to have judiciary also examines the validity of law in accordance with the constitution. And the have judiciary is also the final interpreter of the constitution. And being the final interpreter of the Constitution, judicial action necessitates promotion and protection of social and economic values, political values which are scripted in the Constitution. That's what the judiciary need to keep in mind as final interpreter of the Constitution. And to, see, to execute this responsibility, judiciary must be independent and neutral because of the nature of responsibility interested upon this institution. And because of that nature, it is essential also to have a composition which befits the responsibility interested upon it. And that's why it is said that the judges who constitute judiciary should be of right caliber and are known for their integrity and independence. So that's why the appointment of judges must be apolitical and uninfluenced by extraneous factors. And in that light, it becomes very significant to give a, it becomes very significant to see that who are judges, what is the composition of judiciary, because judges, they do involve in expanding the meaning of individual rights and also to furthering the social, goal, social goals which are there in the constitution. And therefore, the social fabric of a country has a very important role to play in the composition of judiciary. And more so, this role becomes more important when, after second and third judges' case, which has been briefly referred by Mr. Prabhakar, the authority to appoint judges has been practically, practically shifted from executive to the judiciary. Now it is the collegium which decides who will man the higher judiciary. That's why it is very, very important that what and how the composition of judiciary should be. And more so, it becomes more important and relevant that nowadays judiciary is engaged in social justice, social transformation and that's why it raises a very important question of internal aspect of independence. And when I say internal aspect of independence, what I mean is that, that whether the composition of judiciary can rightly understand the pain and suffering of the millions for whom 
the governance matter the most. And that's why this judicial excursion into social and economic issues invites a debate on reflective and representative judiciary, which is essential for faith and confidence in the judiciary. And when I say reflective and representative judiciary, I'm not advo advocating here reservation in judiciary. I'm just saying that if you have a meritorious person there in, on the bench or in the bar, you must consider them, collegium must consider them to elevate to the higher judiciary. So nowhere I'm advocating having reservation in judiciary, but I'm certainly advo advocating to have a reflective and representative judiciary. And when I take this debate, if you look into the instances, you'll find that debate is institutionalized. I read a news report. It was reported in the Indian Express when the when Justice K.G. Balakrishnan was made Chief Justice of India. The report goes like this, that the new CGI, K.G. Balakrishnan, who was sworn in today at ceremony at the presidential place, is the first Dalit to make it to the pinnacle of the judiciary. And then, when Justice Gansuda Misra, she became the judge of the Supreme Court. She said, I feel that I am representing women folk in the Supreme Court. I feel happy that the CGI and other judges in the collegiums have reposed faith in me and in the ability of women. If you read this, and if you read in between line, I see these news reports appearing in the media, educate us on our identities and inform us about the reality of the Indian society. And similarly, if you look into the other reports of scheduled caste, scheduled tribes uh, committee on the welfare, parliamentary committee reports, they have such a committee report, they have echoed the similar sentiments that we need to have representation of those who are unrepresented in the higher judiciary. Again, I say this is not a case of reservation in judiciary. This is the case where we, we have a meritorious people. They must be given representation in the higher judiciary. Why it is important? Because it is important because they are involved in not only settling the disputes between two litigating parties, their involvement is more than that to the, to the extent of setting the policy matters. And that's the reason why I say that there's a justification for this. And the justification is that, that they are no more engaged in policy, they are no more engaged in dispute settling, they are engaged in policy making. So much so in the recent judgment of 2010, between the disputes between the Ambani brothers, the court made to say, court was, court said that in the matter of extraction of natural resources, the government must involve or engage public sector undertakings. This is nothing but a policy statement given by the Supreme Court. Because it was nowhere in the dispute that how this excavation or exploration of natural resources should be taken place. But that's what the court, you know, remarked. So this is what is the court has been setting the policies and for exercising such power in democracy, the judiciary must also have similar, if not the same, justification as the other two organs of the government. And other two organs of the government, as it is well known, is executive and legislature. So the need of reflective judiciary also stemming up from the fact that the role of representative executive has been reduced to stamp the recommendation made by the collegium in the matter of, a, in the, matter of the appointment of judges in the higher judiciary. And the judiciary as a branch of government, not merely a dispute resolution institution, requires composition on social pattern of the society. Taking the justification further, judges decide the cases upon background understanding based on fundamental values of the system. And if the judiciary is not reflective of, the so of society as a whole, the adjudication may be based on the background understandings strongly colored by narrower set of values. So that's why we need to have, we must have, you know, we must have represented the judiciary. And if I can further strengthen my argument by presenting few stances before you, if you look into the interpretation of equality clause, that is Article 14 of the Constitution in 50s and 60s or till late 70s, you'll find that it has been more tilted towards the American jurisprudence giving more primacy to the rights of individuals than rights of community. And that's why directive principles were not guiding the judiciary in interpreting